and the other persons involved in this project are besides me, Einari Happonen, who is... can't hear anything back okay. here. We can't hear, yes. Can hear. Okay. Other persons involved is are Einari, who is a software developer, and Teemu Rintala, who is a mathematician, and Joni Tuomisto, who is the leader of our research group. So, so first I talk to you about the Opasnet, which is our media wiki site, which uses all the data stuff I'll be focusing on. And the Opasnet base is the external database for storing mainly numerical data. And I will show you that, its structure and its user interface. And table to base and Opasnet base import are ways to import or uplo upload data into that Opasnet base. And R is the statistical software which runs all kinds of calculations and they can be made directly from Wiki. Okay, there's the address for Opasnet. Please visit our site. It's really media wiki site and it's hosted by our department. So what Opasnet actually is? It's a website for supporting societal decision making and it collects, synthesizes and communicates people's values and scientific information. As you can see from the diagram, there are one arrow which has scientific facts and personal values. They are used in a, as a inputs in open assessments in a Opasnet. And the open assessment pro process produces options for informed decision making for policy makers and stuff like that. And why we need things like Opasnet and open assessment? Because we think current assessment are poor. They are done in a closed expert groups and results are communicated in static reports. So you don't have any kind of possibility to participate in any way in these processes. And we think that assessment process should be open, transparent and constantly improving. And that's why we are using MediaWiki. And how? How this actually works? From the diagram, you can see that there seems like to be an oil leak in environment, and two guys notice the leak. Other one does nothing, but the other one starts to write a page about it in Opasnet. And so the assessment process begins. And the more people get involved, and eventually somebody decides to take some action and cleans up the mess. That was the... That was the idea behind Opasnet. But now I go to Opasnet base, which is a separate database. It's running on MySQL. It has about 13 tables and it's running on separate virtual server. And we need this separate database because assessments often need large amount of amounts of numerical data. And Wiki isn't that good with numbers. So therefore we created this separate base. And it's designed to store information in almost any format, from probability distribution to textual data. Basically, if you can make a table, table out of your data, you can put it into Opasnet base. Okay, then the user interface. It's uh, designed as a special page in Wiki, and I'm going to show it to you now. This is a variable page in Opasnet. It, it deals with narcolepsy cases in Finland. So on your right side, you can see there's a small information box about this variable, and from here, you can access the results. And this is the user interface for browsing the data from the database. 
And here you can see that this particular variable has two indices, age group and year of observation. So I pop that out. And these are the, I can make choices between these. Let's say I'm now interested only in persons with age group between 15 to 19. And then I saw the results. And it produces table out of the database. And you can download it as a CSV file or sort them but however you like. So that's basically the user interface for processing data. There isn't much more to that. Oh. And it, it has a version history, so I can go back to previous uploads also, like that. Okay, so far I only showed you how to access the data, but you also need to have some means to write the data into the ta ta database also. Therefore we have made this table to base extension. It's a extension for storing data directly from wiki tables into OpenStack base. And I'm going to show you an example of that. Also. It's the same variable again. Here is the data. It's a small data set so it can easily fit into the wiki page. I go edit and there is the syntax. It's just a tag. You have to make some definitions because these are quite complex, not so complex, but a bit more complicated table because we have multiple results in one row. So I can change the data like this. And now the actual results are wrong but it's, it's up updated instantly and it goes directly into database. That table base was suitable for small data sets which you can write into wiki, wiki pages but we have also bigger data sets and therefore we need this OpusNet base import this can store data directly from CSV or XLS files into OpusNet base and is suitable for bigger data sets. I'm going to show you an example of that too. Here you can see the upload data link. I have to define unit for the data. And there are options but I don't have to use them right now. So I'll open up the file. Okay, then I push upload. It gives you a preview of that data and I can see that it's not, it's not right. <coughs> so I have to go back. I've used different delimiter, I used comma. It doesn't remember the file I just shows it. It's a bug. Okay, now it looks more appropriate. Okay, and the data has been uploaded into database. I can go directly to the browser if I want to. And the last extension is the R extension. And uh, as I mentioned, R is a programming language and software environment for statistical computing and graphics. It's a GNU project. It basically works as a command, command line, but it, it has several graphical user interfaces available also. 
And we have installed server version of R into our same server that our wiki is running. And I'd like to show you now the actual R code in the wiki page. It's a quite complicated thing, but if you know how to write it, you, it's not that easy. <laughs> Even though if you know that, it's really, really hard. I, I didn't write it, the demo, the mathematician did this. It's long, and from this button I can run the code, but I won't do it now because it takes maybe five to ten minutes to do the calculations. And the R also, it find, fetches the results from the OpusNet base. It uses the same variables and same data. But I have, I have, well, I have run this, this calculation before and it's always stored in the server so you can access your previous calculations. It has uh, also, kind of history back up. So, it, <laughs> the results look like this. There is actual calculations done, and the results are usually in the end, <coughs> end part of the section. There are some results there. They are on green. And some graphs also. I think I think that's basically it. Questions? Yep. So it looks like uh, you did a template for using uh, uh, R. Yes. From uh, wiki page, but it seems that uh, there is also something more to it because you made decisions using your system. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. We usually have a, some sort of moderator in, with it. We have a moderators for pages, but anyone can edit. So, so far we haven't had, had any misinformation our, in our pages put on, on purpose. Of course you can put misinformation by accident, but not on purpose yet. So we don't yet have a solution for, good solution for that. Yep. Yes, most of our. So, how do you pose the question to the system to get the recommendation based on the Do you mean that you you have a, some kind of you want to start an own own assessment or something like that? You just go go to. Create, create articles and create assessment. Yep. Actually, the graphical converse, conversation is conversion is made using R. Yeah. Not at this point. I I don't think so, but it's possible.
I think you should use, I think Google has something like Google Graphs or something like that, that can produce graphs out of. Uh, okay, thank you. So, thank you to Yuha. And we now have uh, Ron and Trimo coming up together to give a presentation. There they are. So people, little known fact, even Apple machines can crash. So that apparently just happened. So Timo is rebooting his computer and um, the presentation should be right there. Oh, is this the part where I get to do stand-up comedy? Yeah. yeah. See, I'm not as good as, as, at that as Samana is, so. Oh, my God. So this presentation is about Resource Loader, which is a project that um, myself and Trevor Pascal, who unfortunately could not make it here, have been working on for the past year or so, and um, in the later stages with the help of Timo, who's presenting with me here, um, we're going to tell you we're going to tell you what Resource is and why we implemented it, um, what it does for you, and why you should use it, and if you're a programmer, how you should use it. So let, let's take a look at. Is only one request and is actually fairly tiny. Um, what's really important is the amount of JavaScript that's on the page, which is enormous. Um, this is what things looked like before we did resource loader, so in like January of this year. Um, and there were, there was like almost 400 kilobytes of JavaScript being loaded in 29 requests. And we have some CSS, which is a fair amount, but not really, uh, not really problematic. And a bunch of images, which are tiny, but there are 22 of them, and they get loaded in 22 separate requests, which takes forever because browsers will only load so many things in parallel at a time, and there's a lot of overhead in doing requests. Now, the problem here is, of course, mostly with JavaScript because it's like the big thing and takes up most of the screen, obviously. But um, um, when people think about performance, though, they mostly they usually think about server-side performance, and basically the blue part in this graph. Um, and trying to get that to render faster and be delivered faster and be smaller. But it's kind of obvious that the blue part is not the problem here. It's mostly the green and the purple part. So after we deploy resource loader, the main page looked more like this, where um, we still had some uh, multiple requests for things like JavaScript, CSS, and images. Um, but that is mostly due to user-specific things. And the four images here are like the, like the pictures that you see on the main page. They're actually not the icons that are in the skin because the number of requests for icons in the skin is zero. They're all inside the style sheets. But more about that later. OK, so the resource loader loads all of these resources um, with a term we call modules. And modules consist of three different elements. The first element is scripts. Uh, scripts are the CSS files, this can be, uh, sorry, the JavaScript files. It can be one or more files. Uh, the styles, so that's all the CSS files. And all the localization messages, because when we dynamically create interfaces, we want them to be localized in the correct language. Um, these modules are packed up by the resource loader and loaded as one single module to the, to the client side. Uh, we could stop there, but we're not only combining uh, resources as one module, but we're also combining multiple modules into one request. So then these get packed up and sent to the client as one request. Um, so this is how it eventually looks like. We're now going to discuss a little bit about how you can use this and how it a little bit works on the inside. So yeah, the following is going to be a more or less random um, interleaving of um, techniques that we use, um, what they do on the, on the, on like the back end, and um, how you can actually use them. So we discussed what a module was, and this is how you actually register one in code. Um, you give your module a name, which um, if your code is an extension, um, the convention is to start it with x dot. Um, if your code is core, it will usually start with MediaWiki dot or, or jQuery dot or whatever is appropriate to our naming conventions. 
Um, a module, as we said, includes scripts. I'll have to point that way. Um, so you just give it the name of your the path to your script file or script files, if you have more of them, you can just pass in an array and Resource Loader will combine the files for you. Um, again, there's styles which Resource Loader will, will load for you if you um, pass them in. Um, you can pass in inter internationalization messages and these are just message keys in MediaWiki's existing internationalization system. Um, the only reason you have to, have to list them here is so that Resource Loader knows which messages are being used in your module and that it can export them to the client for you. Um, and then there's dependency information where you list which modules need to be loaded before your module can run. And then Resource Loader will take care of that um, jQuery UI button, in this case, immediately with the title, um, have been loaded before X foobar um, gets to run its code. So that's how you register a module. Now, what does Resource Loader do with all this information? Um, the first thing we're going to look at is this, the CSS file. The CSS file will most likely contain references to images. And the traditional way of how you optimize images has been sprites. So um, we've looked at sprites and basically said no. Uh, so why do we say no to sprites? They make all everything in one request. They make it very efficient. They're very fast. And for, all, for many good users, they are very good. But there is one disadvantage, and that's that you have to manually create them and manually maintain them. Uh, so this is what, for example, a sprite looks like. This is for the vector skin watch chart. You may recognize it. It's being used on a page inside the page. Uh, there on the right next to history, there's the watch star. So how is this being done if we would use sprites? The images would basically be overlaid in CSS on top there. And by using CSS background position, it crops it out, and you only see that part of the image. That's a lot of code to maintain. Um, it can be automated, but whenever the graphic designer would uh, provide a new image, you have to recreate the sprites, you have to mess with the background position, not to mention the limitations such as background repeat. Um, you can imagine if you would want to have a background full of stars, you would leak out the other stars unintentionally. You cannot crop them out this way. So that's why we would want to keep the separate images. We want to keep the images separate. Um, and to still have the advantage of spriting, we use a technique called data embedding. And that's what Ron is going to talk about. Yeah, so what we want are sprites without the suckiness, basically. Um, and the way that we figured we'd, we would do that is something called data URI embedding, where, um, as I alluded to earlier, you embed the image inside of your CSS style sheet. So what the programmer writes in their CSS style sheet is this. It's a normal background image rule with a URL that points to an image for a single icon, not, not a sprite, not anything with multiple icons. And they prefix it with a comment that says add embed, which is kind of a magic hint for resource loader, which causes it to do some magic. And it will, what will actually gets into the client ends up look, looking more like this, where the um, image is read from disk. It is base64 encoded. And the base64 data is um, put into the CSS style sheet. And now this gets loaded. And this is not an, a URL references anymore. It's just the data of the image that's embedded in a CSS style sheet. This will make your style sheet bigger, of course, because it will contain all these images instead of point to them. It will also make the images themselves bigger because they're now base64, and that's 33% bigger than um, normal binary. However, with this, after gzip, it's actually better. Um, not, not to mention that you've just eliminated like 18 um, requests that you don't need to do anymore. So that saves a lot in request overhead. Um, another fun magic feature that we do is um, flipping for right to left languages, such as Hebrew. So a typical CSS style sheet, you know, like an example might be this, where you've got a number of references to things that are like left or right or LTR or even the margin rule up there, you'll see like um, two picks and four picks are the, mar are the positions for left and right. And um, if you view this style sheet on English Wikipedia, that's fine, because the programmer probably wrote this for an LTR language. If you view this on Hebrew Wikipedia, however, um, Resource Loader will do some magic for you, and it will come out like this, where it's basically um, changed everything that was left to right and right to left. It's even changed the name of your image from dash LTR to dash RTL. And it's flipped around the two picks and the four picks rules. So this is actually quite smart. It's a little program called CSS Janus, originally written by Google. 
And it's quite smart, and it can basically make an exact mirror of your CSS style sheets. And of course, I guess the order slides a little bit out of order here. The reason you want this is so that you can make English Wikipedia look like this and make Hebrew Wikipedia an exact mirror of it. And this is all automated. I mean, previously, we did this kind of stuff by hand. And that's tedious, and it gets out of date, and just generally sucks. And automation has some downsides, because there is some, there is a small minority of things that you don't want to flip. But overall, it's better than doing it you know, the human way. So a little bit about uh, the, the flipping. Whenever you want to override it to not no flip, there is a, a support for that. You can add, add no flip in a comment, and uh, Caesar Janus and Resource Loader will skip that rule uh, in case there are some rules that should not be flipped. Uh, so the, the startup module is basically what enables all the smartness in, combi in uh, combining and uh, modulizing of all these resources. The startup module starts with a short sanity check. It checks whether your browser has support for jQuery and has support for all the, the, all the features we use. Uh, MediaWiki has support for Index Explorer 6, Firefox 2, uh, Opera 9. It has, uh, it, the support goes uh, pretty far back. But in case we would ever lower the support, or whenever we would uh, give up certain browsers, for example, right now we do no longer support Inno Explorer 5, whoever would guess that, um, it checks that and it will skip it. So that any, none of the JavaScript is executed in Inno Explorer 5 and there will be no warnings or whatever. So the only script tag that's actually in the body is the startup module. And the second part in the startup module is the dependency map. And, and it contains all the information of which modules need other modules to load first. Um, the reason it does that, so that, that way whenever you load a module, it can see which modules need to be loaded first, and it will load them in the same request. So, for example, if you see here, if you would load module A and it needs B and C, it will load them first, and then it will load A. Uh, last but not least, in the startup modules, all the uh, uh, MediaWiki configuration variables, so that JavaScript can, for example, look in which namespace we are currently at, what the page name is, what the username is, and all these kinds of configuration variables. So the client side loader? That is me. Okay. So. Uh, suppose we are on the page and we have already loaded a few modules and at some point uh, the loader is being asked to sort m uh, load a certain module of which some dependencies we've already loaded. A very common module is for example jQuery UI. Uh, many modules use jQuery UI but not all of them. So whenever jQuery UI is already loaded we don't load it twice so we skip it and we only load the module that we really need. So it keeps track of what's already been loaded. Another thing it does for what is left that still needs to be loaded it batches it into one request and it does this asynchronously. So it's, it is very well possible that some modules are, are loaded before they need it, but it executes them in the right order. It uses uh, JavaScript wrapping. And we'll come back to that in, uh, in the next slide, actually. JavaScript wrapping. Yeah, that's your slide. So, so yeah, we need some, like Timo says, we need some smartness um, because modules might arrive in the wrong order, but we still want them to execute in the wrong order. Specifically because of certain caching concerns, things often arrive in like alphabetic order. Um, but dependencies, of course, are typically, well, are usually not in alphabetic order. So what we do is we wrap our little script in um, a call to something called meter we can lower to implement, um, which we tell the module name. And we put the code, uh, the JavaScript code for your module inside a closure which um, in practice for developers, this means that your code does not run in the global scope anymore. So this may cause and actually has caused um, bugs in JavaScript code because um, the code previously assumed and could assume that it was running in the global scope and had access to global variables and all that. Um, that is no longer true. Then also inside the JavaScript, we load the CSS, which seems a little bit strange. But this allows us, again, to save requests because we're putting two things in one response. Um, and the JavaScript, of course, the loader, when it receives this, will take the CSS and inject it into the DOM and load it for you. And um, a third thing that we also put in here are the internationalization messages, as mentioned previously. Um, they have to be exported because they're not available on the client side by default. Um, and we put those in the same request as well because we like putting things in the same request because that saves space. Okay. So uh, a little example about how modules are loaded. Um, there's a new entry point as of, of MediaWiki 1.17 called loaded.php. And JavaScript make, makes requests to loaded.php and it passes the 
uh, environmental variables such as the skin, the language, and the debugging mode. And of course, the, the a string of module names uh, piped, uh, separated by a pipe. And what loaded PHP does it, is it, it outputs minified church scripts, totally combined of everything together, all the resources within the module and the separate modules together. And an example response could, for example, look like this, where the full module that we just saw is being implemented, and at the end you see a little snippet of the bar module. And these are all loaded in, in one single request for all the modules that are needed. All right, so that was our short 15-minute overview of Research Loader. Um, the slides for this presentation will be on the Wikitech um, page, which whose URL you see up there. They're not yet, and they may not appear there for some time, depending on how good the Wi-Fi is that we get. Um, the Bitly link points to the submission, the Wikimedia submission page for this talk, and the bottom link points to all the documentation on MediaWiki.org that we have um, on research lo about Research Loader. Um, so thank you guys for, all, for your time, and um, special thanks to Trevor Pascal, who's not here, but who did write like half the stuff that is in this, um, in this presentation. And we will now take questions. Yes? No, I was about to I was preparing. <laughs> 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 that is a very elaborate uh, preparation, Andrew. There was a question back there. Um, well, if you have a JavaScript interface that needs, um, so if you have a little piece of JavaScript that needs to like show a dialogue with a message in it, then you want that message to be translatable. And that means that you have to send the translation for that message um, to the JavaScript side. And w one way that it's currently being done is like you can put like all the 280 translations in your script, but that is like hard for, that's not very maintainable and it's a waste of resources to send, you, to send me 280 uh, translations when I only really want English. So this is the way that we only send you the language that you need and only send you the messages that, we need, that you need. Uh, another reason we export the messages to JavaScript is that you can, for example, use variables. Uh, suppose you have a message that says uh, hi and then a name uh, and the last time you were visited, there will be, uh, the same as in PHP, you can use dollar signs as uh, variables that will be re replaced dynamically. And we want to be able to dynamically replace them on the client side as well. So that's why we need all the messages as they are on the client side. Um, yeah, you again? Uh, doesn't this, uh, does the server <coughs> send the actual messages to the client? Yes. That's, that's uh, oops. Show again. So, th so that's what MW Loader I I implement does. It'll be here somewhere. It's over here. So when a module is being implemented by loaded PHP, it, uh, it, it passes the actual JavaScript, which is all the JavaScript files co combined, all the CSS files combined, and as third part of the module are all the messages. So this is what actually gets sent from the server to the client. And it includes your code and your internationalization. I think, yes, Yarn. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, first, is, uh, is, is all this stuff, uh, this theoretical, is this concept unique to me or are there other script modeling systems and other software? There are, I mean, of course, none of this, we didn't like invent all of this, right? The internet is a big place and there are lots of other systems out there that do this kind of stuff. What is relatively unique is that we have a broad spectrum of things and we do all of them. Like JavaScript minification is a known technique, uh, CSS minification is a known technique. Data URI embedding is a little bit obscure, but sort of known. But um, people tend to want to, like, for instance, with JavaScript unification, like squeeze every drop out of it and like get it to fully optimize. And we kind of we sort of applied an 80-20 rule and said, like, okay, we're most of the way there. Um, it would be more productive if we switched our attention to like data URI embedding instead, instead of trying to get that last 20% out of um, JS um, minification. Um, so. Some of the things that we're doing here are fairly novel. Some of them are fairly old school, but um, overall, it's it's pretty nice. And you had a second question? Uh, yeah, um, I've, I've heard the, I've heard seen lots of positive things about resource learning. The only negative thing I've heard is that uh, because it, it waits uh, to uh, to load the CSS and JS at the end, you sometimes see weird things on the page uh, right at the beginning. 
So, so when Resource Loader was just new, it was um, some may argue that it was deployed too soon. I would disagree, but uh, there are certain things that were meant a, li a little bit too quick. Uh, one of the things that, Java, the, that Resource Loader supports is uh, it has separate queues for loading modules. It has a queue for the top and a queue for the bottom. And by default, scripts are at the bottom for legacy reasons because some scripts always assume that they will be loaded from the bottom. So we cannot put them in the head because, for example, if you have a module that I don't know, uh, tries to access the tab bar, it doesn't exist in the head. So we default to the bottom, but every module can uh, set a property in the registry. Actually, we left it out of the example. I'm not sure why we did that. Um, in a registry in PHP, when you register a module, there is scripts, styles, messages, dependencies. Another one is the property for load queue. You can, for example, register a module that will be loaded from the top, and it will be loaded from the top. And for example, things like uh, liquid threads, maybe it's the one you're referring to, uh, that didn't have styling until at the end of the page. We had not fixed that by putting the styles for li liquid threads to the top of the page. So that when a, page, when a page is loaded, the styles are already there. So uh, that has been fixed. It should be noted that the whole top loading queue thing is something that was uh, written after resource loader was deployed. So it's not, um, well, no, that's a lie. It's live on the site now. Um, but we're, we're still kind of grappling with how to best resolve this. So it's kind of an unresolved issue, but we're aware of it and we're trying to um, figure out the best way to do it. Because uh, one of the other problems is, I, sh I spoke to Jon Hal Sobi last night, and he's just spent half a year in Tanzania, where the internet is really damn slow. So um, he was like, well, my web page loads, and then 30 seconds later, wiki editor loads. And so I said, well, we could load wiki editor from, your, from the head, but then you would just see a blank page for 30 seconds. So there, there's all sorts of trade-offs there, and you want there, there's a number of technical trade-offs that we have to investigate. Yes. Do we have time for one last question? Last question, okay. Uh, yes, so um, in the first phase of resource loader, we focused on making the core media wiki a lot more efficient, so that's being skins, extensions, and such. The second phase of resource loader is what we are actually right now working on. We've done a lot of work uh, during Wikimania in the, in the late night hours. We're trying to bring all this efficiency to user scripts and gadgets, uh, hopefully by the, by the end of this year. So that's the second version of resource loader, bringing um, load positioning, efficiency, and all these localization to gadgets and user scripts. That is coming very soon. And another thing I'd like to mention here is that um, <laughs> part of the second phase of Resource Loader is not just making the existing gadgets better. We're also introducing a new concept of global gadgets. We will uh, finally, after years of requests, um, introduce a central repository for gadgets where you can load a gadget from one central location to any of the 800 wikis. Right. I think that's all we have time for because it's game's turn now. Thank you so much. Diedrich, and together with my colleagues Dario and Ryan, we want to make this more into a panel than a presentation. So we have some slides just to launch some ideas, but actually we really are hoping to make this an interactive discussion more than a presentation. I think I, I'm okay like this. I'm not. Barely. Barely. Better? Way better. Okay. So, we want to push the idea that we are not open enough. And that might seem maybe a bit strange because in our values, in our mission, we are really pushing the idea of being open and free. But we can be even more open. And I'll give you first an uh, first a anecdote about how open we are sometimes. So. For the last couple of months, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation is running a competition together with Kaggle in which we have built a data set uh, of our editors for the last couple of years. And we asked people to build a predictive model based on the data, come up with a model that predicts six months in the future how many edits people are going to make. Kaggle uh, hosts this uh, competition for us, and usually they 
uh, have to convince the co a, co uh, a company to open up their data. The issue with us was that actually the answers are out there. You can actually look up the answer if you really want to. So in our case, we are really open and we had to make some preparations to make sure people could not look up the answers. So we are open. There's a lot of data available in our dumps that we make available in the APIs. And still, we have to be more open is our main proposition. And because the thing is, you have to come to the site. All the interaction happens on the site. And so it's quite a centralized solution. And so we should become more decentralized. And so to illustrate this point of becoming more decentralized, um, um, oh yeah, so, sorry. So we can we become more cent decentralized and we should also open up for more non-human interactions. So we can actually, th that way we can actually uh, enable these non-human interactions. And one, I'll give you a very short uh, case which is not uh, centered around the Wikipedia uh, community, but a different case just to kind of illustrate what it would mean if we decentralize. So non-human interactions means interactions that are um, automated, basically. So for example, yeah, I don't want to cut your grass away. So I'm kind of trying to uh, don't uh, give away the, the secret. Um, Ryan will take that more into detail in non-human interactions. And actually, he already alluded to it just five minutes ago. So um, very quick idea of what it means to decentralize and how it actually enables participation. What I did for this presentation, I looked at eight different open source uh, communities that have recently switched from a centralized source control system, either Subversion or CVS, and they migrated towards either Git or Mercurial. Well, I'm not going to go in much, deep, in, in much detail, but there are these two different competing models about how to run a source control system. CVS and Subversion are centralized. Uh, the commit access is usually restricted to very few developers, and to get commit access, you need to do lots of tricks, usually. Well, in a decentralized model, basically everybody can clone the entire trunk and can modify and augment it um, as they see fit. So uh, I've taken Python, uh, Linux, uh, GPSD, Perl, Mozilla, PostgreSQL, GNOME, and OpenOffice. These are all uh, project that projects that have migrated either towards Mercurial or Git. And so basic question, what happens in the number of developers after you migrate? If our proposition is true that more decentralized systems allow for more participation, then you would expect that after they migrate, they will have more active developers. So I'm not going to, um, I took the data from Olo.net uh, um, uh, for the really econometric uh, savvy people. This is a uh, count model. It's a binomial regression. Um, I'm controlling for a whole bunch of uh, other factors like the number of developers active in the previous month, um, the number of comments, how much lines have been added, a whole bunch of year dummies, how old the project is. But the main takeaway of this uh, regression analysis is that actually there's a significant uh, increase in the number of developers after they migrate. Um, just the fact that you're switching from system, um, it's not that big an effect, to be honest. It's a 0.2%. However, that, in that interest is that effect is way bigger um, depending on uh, the interaction between your previous system, either CVS, Subversion, and Git Mercurial. And so the biggest effect is if you go from CVS, the more even the most old school version, uh, so to say, to a Mercurial, then you almost get a 1.6% 1. 1. increase. That's just only changing your system. You're not changing anything else. Um, if you're a large, uh, a la a large um, uh, open source project and you have about 100 developers, that means two more developers. Just that, like that. Two more developers. And so, um, this is not, uh, I'm going to wrap, wrap, wrap it up right now because there's more stuff to be said, but just the idea of decentralizing increased participation, we can actually have some data that uh, supports this notion. So, decentralizing interaction increases participation and now Ryan will go about this a bit more in more detail about these non-human interactions. 
So what we're looking at is uh, using OpenID and OAuth. And these things, first we have OpenID, which is an authentication um, protocol. And basically it's a decentralized protocol for authentication that uses both um, either as a consumer or as a <laughs> supplier, provider. And <clears throat> with this, you can, like, if you've ever used, uh, like, log in with Twitter or connect with Facebook. Connect with Facebook doesn't actually use OpenID, but it uses something that has a very similar concept. And so the concept is that you can log in to one application using another application's credentials. Meaning, like, you would be able to log in with, th with some external application from Wikipedia to you can, you, you can log into that using Wikipedia, for instance, using your Wikipedia credentials. OAuth is something that allows applications to do things on a user's behalf without that user having to give away their username and password. So this external application using a combination of OpenID and OAuth could do a number of things on your behalf. Of course, you can tell the app, you can tell Wikipedia in this situation, which things that, the, uh, uh, that this application is able to do on your behalf. So the concept is to decentralize actions on Wikipedia to external applications to allow them to do things for us. Okay, so uh, now the, uh, the question, the rationale for this, uh, for this proposal uh, comes from the question of uh, what are the possibilities that this uh, solution may enable. And the basic question is that, uh, uh, first of all, the Wikimedia Foundation has uh, uh, obviously limited resources to put into, into development. So we, can, we should focus on what is crucial uh, and a top priority for our community, which is uh, developing the best and most robust and most stable infrastructure for our core business, which is uh, uh, supporting editorial activity via our websites. However, uh, there's an interesting aspect uh, of uh, development that uh, could lead with a relatively small investment of resources. So by, by supporting technologies like those that uh, Ryan mentioned, OpenID and OAuth, we could actually tap into much larger uh, pool of uh, uh, developer resources, and we could open up uh, the, uh, the development of uh, applications and tools that could support our, our communities, but we at the foundation don't have at the moment uh, the, uh, enough resources to, uh, to implement. And just to give an example, um, I thought I'd focus on, uh, on uh, three kinds of potential um, uh, end users and use cases for, um, for these applications. So first of all, think of editors. Uh, at the moment, we do have an API, um, and the API allows uh, retrieving content from, uh, from a database and doing some uh, smart uh, interaction with our, with our, our contents. Uh, but what it doesn't allow is uh, to reuse uh, your login credentials and uh, use these credentials to uh, produce content uh, uh, on, a separate, uh, on a separate server, on a separate uh, um, um, uh, application. So we think, for example, that uh, implementing OpenID and OAuth could uh, support the development of uh, tools like uh, imagine um, a power photo editor uh, that could be uh, hosted on a total, uh, totally independent server uh, that will allow you to reuse uh, your existing um, credentials as a, a Wikipedia or, or Commons editor. You would be allowed to uh, do some uh, uh, advanced uh, editing of these photos, maybe allow uh, adding uh, metadata or uh, retouching photographs. And then the system could actually post, upload a version of the photo to comments on your behalf. So this is an example of a, a power tool that could uh, uh, enhance the uh, editor experience uh, from, a, from a contribution point of view. But the same technology could also support uh, um, a richer experience for uh, readers. So at the moment we have a, a uh, a pretty passive notion of, uh, of readers and consumers of our content. So actually, most of our features uh, are, are focused on, uh, uh, on editors, so we're not yet uh, trying to engage uh, uh, readers into becoming more active. We are experimenting with a number of features, but uh, uh, we would like ideally to make readers um, more, more, more actively participating in, in Wikimedia projects and trying to find ways to engage them into becoming full-fledged editors. Now, uh, 
with the, with the technology like OAuth, uh, we could uh, um, allow external applications to access uh, uh, one's watch list. And uh, these external applications could uh, uh, build smart notification tools uh, uh, to manage uh, pages you care about and be notified about changes in these pages. And uh, uh, basically allow all sort of a, a smart interaction with uh, uh, contents of Wikipedia as a reader that at the moment we cannot support uh, um, at the, as part of our core development because, uh, again, our focus is you know, on different kinds of, uh, of uh, reader-oriented features. But at the same time, the same technology could support uh, new forms uh, of, uh, um, of collaboration that don't fall under the editors or reader category. Now, think, for example, of the idea of uh, new collaborative content that could be built on top of our contents. Like, uh, for example, the idea of uh, semantic annotations uh, uh, for, uh, for Wikipedia pages or uh, annotations of links between articles. Now, there are in, in the semantic web community, people will be extremely um, eager uh, to get uh, 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 an existing and active editor community to start producing this kind of, uh, of data. But unfortunately, we cannot provide the service because, uh, uh, again, our focus uh, is, uh, um, is uh, on, on different kinds of, uh, um, of features. So again, OpenID and uh, 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 a lightweight uh, auth implementation would actually support this kind of, of uh, application we think could uh, uh, increase uh, participation and uh, new um, collaboration models. Um, and I want to comment quickly on the question of uh, risks and, uh, and uh, the implication for particip participation. So first of all, you may think that opening up uh, um, access to a contents to a third party application could actually threaten um, the viability of our core project. And actually, as it turns out, uh, many social media platforms uh, have been experimenting with the model of uh, creating an ecosystem of applications. And actually, the ecosystem of applications turned out to uh, reinforce and increase uh, the existing user base. If you think of Flickr, Flickr launched uh, uh, what they call uh, the, their app garden, so uh, an API focused on creating third-party applications back in 2009, and by now they have, uh, uh, I think, something of the order of a couple of thousand uh, applications. I don't have, unfortunately, the data available, but these, the, these applications basically uh, resulted in increased uh, support uh, and a richer user experience for, their, uh, for the members. Uh, so there are reasons to believe that this is not going to threaten our user base, but actually uh, potentially increase participation. And uh, this could also uh, help us rethink the way in which we measure participation, because uh, at a time in which we uh, expand beyond uh, our core platform, then we probably need to rethink uh, what we measure. And uh, we think it could be useful um, uh, to start thinking uh, of an approach whereby we would measure participation not at the level of single application, but the level of an ecosystem of applications. So imagine that uh, at the same time where we're uh, supporting this technology, uh, we require to uh, third party developers to share with us as part of the terms of use, uh, matrix about uh, uh, the use and the content is produced um, via these applications. These would actually allow us to measure the, uh, the evolution of our community and the content produced by our community Again, not at the level of a single platform, but the level of the ecosystem. And we think this could have some uh, uh, potentially disruptive effects for uh, our growth uh, and, and, uh, and development as a, as a movement. So uh, I work for the Foundation on Technical Communications, but this was uh, more of a side project. Um, I don't have any slides. Uh, this is supposed to be more like a, a discussion slash workshop. So feel free to ask questions uh, whenever you want. Um, so what I'm going to, to talk to you today um, is um, about a QT library uh, that talks with the MediaWiki API. Um, so does everybody know what QT is? Okay, so there are people who don't know. Um, so QT is a development framework uh, based on C++. And it's the base for the KDE project. Does everybody know what KDE is? Yeah. OK. Uh, so um, yeah. So basically, this all started um, because, um, I mean, so I live in Toulouse in France. And there is a pretty uh, large community of KDE developers there. And, and basically, we just met at a, 
uh, local user group of you know Linux users, etc. And um, at some point, we 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 realized that. Uh, there, there were not many uh, collaborations between Wikimedia and the KDE uh, community, um, and that it was uh, a bit of a pity because there were many uh, possible venues for collaboration. Uh, at some point, I think Wikimedia Germany shared an office uh, with KDE, um, and there were some attempts uh, for collaboration back then, but nothing uh, really came out of that. Um, so basically, uh, uh, a few days before last year's Wikimedia, um, I attended the KDE Academy in Finland, and we tried to, to assemble a, a sort of project uh, proposal. Um, so my main uh, contact in the KDE community was uh, Kevin Otens, who also lives in Toulouse. And um, Kevin uh, has been since 2007 um, organizing a student project um, with the University of Toulouse. So basically, we, we just assembled a, a proposal um, to work, to have the students, students work on um, a QT library uh, to talk with uh, MediaWiki wikis, um, like, uh, like Wikipedia. So the goal was to have the library part that would be, um, you know, the, the basics, and then to try to have uh, proof of concept um, like uh, what I'm going to, to show to you today. Um, yeah, so um, basically the, um, these uh, student projects were um, the opportunity for students to, um, to apply what they had learned uh, in university about uh, agile development and um, test-driven development. So that was the, the context in which um, they realized that. Uh, we tried to have um, all the documentation uh, published publicly. Um, so one of the problems is, uh, is that uh, the documentation is scattered a little bit all over the place. But if there's something that you're looking for um, and you're not finding it, I can probably help with that. So this is um, the community wiki of KDE. Uh, these are all the um, very short uh, scrim notes, for example. So if you're really interested in that, you can look at all the notes, but I wouldn't really uh, encourage you to do it. Um, what I'm going to show you is this. Uh, OK, here it is. So this, for example, is uh, the project vision. So that was the uh, original work that was done by the students to I try and identify the different products that they could work on. So they had, uh, you know, the, the the library itself, and so it, it has the some language that they learn in university. So it's a bit formal. And then there were uh, widgets. So these are desktop widgets. Um, if you and I'm going to to show uh, the prototypes to you today. Um, so for example, if you want to have on your desktop a little widget to show the article of the day of Wikipedia every day, uh, you can do that. If you want to do that for the um, Wikimedia Commons picture of the day, you can do that as well. Um, there was also um, an attempt at doing a, a mass uh, file uploader. Um, so there's uh, a prototype doing that uh, that I'm going to, to show you later today as well. And I, I'm not sure if that was included here. Yeah. Um, and there was some, um, you know, long-term project that obviously we couldn't do uh, in the in the time that we had. That was to to have um, a, a desktop editor for uh, a media wiki wiki uh, that would be able to to work offline. Um, if people are interested in that, we can talk about it uh, afterwards. So, so very briefly, um, so the, the the library itself has uh, its page on the project.kde.org uh, site. 
um, there you can find um, you know recent activity uh, the actual uh, source code uh, this is only the library um, it contains it, it doesn't contain uh, the widgets or that kind of stuff but this can be used uh, by uh, any uh, Qt application okay I already showed that um, there's a very short tutorial on the tech base wiki uh, of KDE that roughly explains uh, what you can do um, with the library and I'm going to, to show you the, uh, an actual example like I was saying um, students were also trying to apply their um, test driven development uh, techniques so they they use um, C dash to to run tests and and you know every week when they had um, their meeting with uh, their scrum master they were proud to show uh, their test coverage etc and all of that was public of course um, and these are um, the actual uh, widgets uh, they, they don't leave uh, with the library because they wanted to have you know the library on one uh, in one place and then the applications uh, in somewhere else um, let me try and show you can you see or do you want me to try and, and make the text bigger uh, okay Is this better or even bigger? There may be no way to do it right, but. <laughs> okay, um, so this uh, this uh, this file is about. Um, a, a very simple uh, program that I'm going to, to show you right afterwards. Um, it's a very basic uh, wiki, um, wiki page editor. Well, basically, you um, you log in, you give the name of the page, and it's going to to fetch the content, and you can edit it and submit it. Um, what I wanted to show you was that uh, here it is. So. I mean the the fact that the library covers uh, quite a bit of the of the API um, that implies that when you want to talk to a media wiki wiki through uh, through the library it's really simple you don't have to re-implement all the API yourself because it's already done um, I'm going to need both my hands for the next uh, So um, this is um, the, the tiny application that is generated by this code. Um, so I'm going to, um, to explain to you what I'm going to do and then I'll do it because I, I can do both at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to, um, to fetch uh, my own user page on the test wiki uh, and then I'm going to load the page and I'll need to copy paste uh, my password and then send. So um, the, 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 the content of the page was loaded. It's, um, it's really basic because I don't have a, a long user page on, on the test wiki.
Okay, so um, I, I loaded the, the content of the page, then I added a, a test sentence. I put my credentials, and I'm going to, to press send, but just before that, I'm going to show you that the page is actually only containing the original content, if I have Wi-Fi. Okay, well, I'll just let it try, and in the meantime, I'm going to, to show you um, the Digicam plugin. And if it moves, uh, just tell me. Um, so Digicam is an imaging application that is used by photographers to manage uh, their collection uh, of, uh, of pictures. Um, it's uh, really useful for, phot for photographers because you have uh, plenty of tools to to, to process your pictures. And um, there are a, a lot of uh, export plugins um, to export directly your pictures to, uh, to Picasa, to Flickr, to Facebook, etc. But there, were n there was no uh, plugin to export to Wikimedia Commons. So that was uh, an obvious choice um, of, uh, of use um, for, the, for the library. So basically, when you're um, in the application, you just have to, to select um, the, the picture and then export to Wikimedia Commons. You have to log in. So uh, just uh, as a reminder, this is all only a proof of concept. It's not uh, already available. And it's actually going to upload to the test wiki, not to the actual Commons. <laughs> Okay, so I'm logged in, so that's good because it means that it's working. Okay, so I'm just going to, to try and start. So you have a, a little progress bar here, and it seems that it's working. Yeah, apparently it worked. So let me try and check again uh, the test wiki. Okay, so what I'm gonna I'm just going to to send this to see if it works as well. Yes, so I have Wi-Fi. So now, if I refresh uh, this page, it should it should con yeah we are testing at Wikimania. And if I look at my contributions, I should see also the the picture that I just uploaded which is here. Yeah. So th there were some uh, minor quicks like, ah, no, I didn't want to do that. Like, for example, um, there are lots of options that you still don't have in the uploader. <coughs> or you, you can even add an edit summary in the very basic uh, page editor. But I mean, these are all uh, proof of concept. Um, Okay, does anyone have any question before I show you the, the widgets? Jean Fred. Um what do you mean? Um, I, I assume so. So uh, maybe I, I should have made this clearer, but I, I'm not the, the, the person who developed this. I, I was acting as, a, as the product owner uh, in actual words. Um, so I, I don't know the code, um, and I, I wouldn't be able to, to answer that question. But I can find who knows. Yes. OK. About, about what? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, when. We have discussed a lot about the hero. Um, and the next talk is about OAuth and OAuth and OAuth. 
Okay. Um, well, I mean, I'll be here uh, for the rest of today and tomorrow, so if anyone has more questions, feel free to come talk to me. And thank you.